Yeah, so here we go. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Topos Institute Colloquium. Today we're excited to have our long-awaited category theory outreach panel. Um, we have four panelists today, Eugenia Cheng, Oliver Lug, Paul Danstep, and Titan A. Bradley. Um, just some quick introductions. So Eugenia Cheng is a mathematician, educator, author, public speaker, and columnist. She was an early pioneer of math on YouTube and the author of several popular math books, including How to Bake Pie and The Joy of Abstraction, an exploration of math, category theory, and life. And Topos is actually running a book club on this. So if you want to join, just you can find out more on our website. So welcome, Eugenia. Um, Oliver Lug runs a fun and informative YouTube channel about math that uh, Emily just posted a, a teaser video for this panel in the in the chat a few minutes ago. Um, it's about math, media, many other subjects. And while pursuing a master's dissertation on category theory, he made some of these category theory videos that got a lot of uh, interest and attracted our attention. So welcome, Oliver. Um, Paul Danstep is an educational designer who for more than 15 years made hands-on exhibits and programs at the San Francisco uh, Exploratorium. Um, he's a self-taught category theorist and uh, category theory enthusiast. And so he's familiar with the challenges faced by learners trying to engage this subject from outside the traditional academic setting. So very happy to have you, Paul. And finally, Tydene Bradley is a mathematician at Sandbox AQ and a master's university. She's the creator of the mathematics blog, Mathema or Math3MA. Uh, co-author of Topology, A Categorical Approach, and a former co-host of the PBS YouTube channel, Infinite Series. So welcome, Ty Danae. And so those are our four panelists, and the panel itself will be moderated by Emily Reel. Um, Emily is a, a professor of mathematics at Johns Hopkins University, working on higher category theory, abstract homotopy theory, and homotopy type theory. And she's published three books, including Category Theory and Context, which is a great book. Uh, she's also active in promoting access to the world of math through popular writing and in interviews and podcasts. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. And uh, please, Emily, the floor is yours. Uh, great. Thanks so much, David. Um, so uh, firstly, before we get started, I want to thank everyone who sent in questions for this panel. Um, everything that we're gonna discuss today was proposed by someone other than me, um, which is really, really, really wonderful. Um, we, as panelists, were super excited about the questions. Um, and uh, I think we'll learn as much from this experience as you will. Um, so for those who wanna contribute to the discussion right now, I think the easiest way to do that is to just make use of the chat. I'll keep an eye on it and pull some things out of there as we go along, so. Anyway, welcome. Um, thanks so much for your participation. So um, an opening question. I mean, one of the, I'm really honored to be in the presence of these panelists who have all in their own way undertaken a significant outreach effort to share ideas from category theory with the broader public. So maybe I'll start by just asking each of you one at a time, um, where do we hope that the category theory community or sort of what do we hope the category theory community will achieve with its outreach efforts in uh, the, let's say, medium future? So feel free to take the timeline as you will. Um, Eugenia, would you like to start? Thanks. Well, thanks to uh, David for inviting us all and for everyone for being here and for questions and to the Topos Institute. Uh, I love thinking about where I would like category theory outreach to be in the next, say, 20 or 30 years when I'm probably approaching the end of my time on this earthly uh, spheroid. And so here are my dreams for the future, um, starting specifically and then getting rather broad because I don't think that category theory outreach can be separated from math outreach, which I also don't think can be separated from education in general, in general which I don't think can be separated from society. And so my big dream is that category theory is done in high school instead of calculus, calculus, and more calculus, that it's also done in college instead of calculus, and that it's taken really seriously as something that everyone uh, can help everyone rather than calculus. Um, I also love, more specifically, I love the idea of this panel. And I think it would be great if, say, the Topos Institute hosted regular panels like this where everyone can submit questions about category theory and get answers. Um, I, in order to help, outreach happen better, I would like to see more incentives and fewer disincentives 
to produce exposition and textbooks and videos and helpful things. Because many of us, at least at first, just did this out of the goodness of our heart with, with no possible benefit to ourselves or to our careers. And I personally was actually criticized for doing it, I was told off by my university. I was told I shouldn't do it. I was told uh, people hated me for doing it, which is why I quit my job. So it sucks to be them. Um, and so I think there should be more into uh, more encouragement and incentives for doing that. And I think there should be more actual outreach and communication jobs, um, including at least one in every single math department. And I think that expo exposition should be embedded into grad school. So for example, everybody when they begin their PhD should write an exposition of their field. And I think it should also be embedded into all education and that there should be more outreach and communication classes in universities. Um, more broadly, I think, of course, we should improve K-12 education so that we don't need so much outreach because if K-12 education were better, then there wouldn't be so many people who were excluded from education. And very radically, I would like to get to a point where men do more domestic and emotional labor so that women have more headspace and also time to learn things that they want to learn. Those are my small dreams for the future. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul, let's hear from you. Uh, sure, so I'm, I, I should actually uh, say that my background, I'm not, a, I, I think I'm alone on this panel as being a non-mathematician. Um, and I feel like my role here in part is maybe to represent someone who is in the middle of a kind of self-administered learning uh, process. Um, but I, yeah, I worked at, um, a hands-on science museum. My background is in education. I'm just really fascinated by the way that uh, people learn and my engagement with mathematics and, and category theory has largely been sort of, sort of recreational aesthetic interest. Um, and I started learning it about five or six years ago and it's been amazing just so many resources have become available in the meantime. So my my sort of hope for the future is just that that, that trend continues um, and that we continue to see more sort of more, more material and more kinds of material with different models of who the learner is and uh, different strategies for trying to communicate the subject to them. Um, the, the two things I think I'm most interested in with regards to this new material are things that are more informal. Um, and I think that how to, Eugenia Cheng's How to Bake Pie is I think a really good example where, um, you know, the, the intent is just not to make a mathematician of the learner, but to just communicate the subject in a correct and clear way. Um, I think category theory has a disadvantage in that it is kind of uniquely hard to preview in terms of like what is actually interesting about this um, is kind of hard to put across. And it's hard for people to get curious about something that they doesn't they don't know exists. Right. So more material that communicates it a little more vividly um, is something I'm always on the lookout for. And then the other thing is that as an educator, I am really fascinated by the particular learning uh, obstacles for, for, for this subject matter. I think the learner of category theory, um, there's a very specific flavor of like cognitive dissonance that you have to get used to. I think when you're first encountering the subject, um, like I, I tried to learn it a few times before I started to make any progress. And I always say it was like, it was like trying to eat something that wasn't food. You know, it was like, it was not like, Math, a lot of math subjects are just very complicated, but this was different. This was like, it wasn't that complicated. It was just very peculiar and very hard to imagine what this was for. And I, as an educator, I'm really fascinated by that obstacle. Like that feels to me like a very interesting expositional challenge is just understanding the psychological hurdles of getting into this theory um, and trying to see if we can come up with more targeted like scaffolding or you know, ways of chaperoning people through that early awkward phase of, of coming into contact with the theory. Uh, wonderful, thanks very much. Uh, Tide and A. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks for being here and to David for the invitation. Um, well, gosh, it's kind of hard to follow up on those two comments because those are really great. So maybe I'll keep this short. Um, so one thing that I think would be wonderful and I think it's happening, but this panel and the efforts of Topo Institute more broadly seem like a really great model for other, um, even branches of math to follow. I mean, I'm not aware of another 
maybe they're out there, but another institute or another, you know, sophisticated area of mathematics that sets aside time to have a panel discussion to like ask the people, how, how can we make an invitation to our field easier for you? Like, like, how can we improve? How can we be clear in our communication? I think that's wonderful. And now if that can be done for category theory, I mean, this would be great for, to set the pace for other fields in mathematics as well. So I think this kind of goes to what Eugenia was saying is that if we can encourage the idea that expository communication is, is not only a good thing, but like a necessary thing, that being clear and thinking simply and thinking intuitively, it's not just like something that rolls off the tongue, but like it takes a little bit of training and it takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of time, but that's something that should be invested in. And it's something that I think should be really elevated. And, and I love the idea of having graduate students um, be forced to write expositional accounts of their work. So I'm thinking, wow, if you can do this in category theory, which is very abstract and yeah, not taught at the high school level, not really taught at the undergrad level. So if you can do this for category theory, then like how much more should you be able to do this for other areas in mathematics um, that maybe are a little bit more tangible or more accessible? So that's what I would love to see. It's just like a shift in the wider mathematical com community, like at large, that this is something, this is like setting the 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 tone or the standard for how mathematics should be communicated at a broad level for all people across the whole world. <laughs> yeah, super meta. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Oliver. Yeah, so I've always been interested in mathematical outreach, um, often more, more so than the maths at times, which is perhaps um, a bit of an indictment on the mathematical outreach itself. Um, but category theory is as people have already said, a bit of a unique beast in, in that regard, because for the general public, mathematics is already kind of a very distant and abstract idea. And then category theory is another level on top of that. And I think my hopes for category theory outreach in the near future would be kind of just a general recognition, um, not necessarily understanding, because it definitely does take effort on the part of the learner to understand and really have a deep appreciation appreciation for these things, but just recognition that this is a thing that's out there and it is something that people are working on, that people, you know, find value in, um, and it's something that's deep and a useful mental model for mathematical mathematical concepts, even at a non-specialist level. So I think it would be good to get more of, more of that perspective conveyed to the general public, really. And I don't want to say increasing excitement but certainly just awareness and exposure uh and have a have category theory just be a component of their view of mathematics as a whole and appreciation for the concept as a concept uh whether they believe that it you know it has real world use or not um which is something that i we we as panelists probably have strong feelings about uh but it's so far been quite hard at least in my experience, to convey that to the public. Um, and I think making more people aware of that and our feelings on that would certainly go a long way. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Eugenia. Thanks everyone. I just wanted to add something, which is that I feel like there's been a bit of a theme of, oh, category theory is much harder than other parts of math. Category theory is much less accessible. Category theory is, is less is is harder to explain to people and i i just want to say I, I think that well i don't want to just directly disagree with everyone but i i think there is a sense in which it is but there is also a sense in which it isn't because it just depends who everyone is right and for me i found i found category theory to be the easiest math i'd ever done and it was the first time i met math and just immediately felt like everything obviously made sense and actually I teach, I've been teaching category theory to art students at the School of the Art Institute since 2015. And they're so much more comfortable with it than any of the math that they did in high school. Because it, because, and, and it's so easy for me to show them how it's relevant to them through questions of social justice and politics. And it's so much more directly useful to their lives than any of that stupid stuff about trig and, and calculus and differential equations and stuff that's allegedly much more accessible. And so I don't, I think it's a mistake to think that there's some kind of hierarchy of of difficulty and that it just depends who everyone is how they think and how we present it and that i find it much easier to show how category theory is relatable to life than than um things like differential equations because because 
I think about category theory in my life and I don't think about differential, I don't use differential equations in my life ever. And so that's, that's, I just wanted to, to make sure we don't just sit here going, oh, it's much harder to talk about category theory. Much, oh, category theory is really hard. Uh. Great. And that's actually a, a wonderful transition to our next question. Uh, so is there a learning path or a roadmap for category theory? Um, and I could interpret this both things you might want to expose yourself to prior to learning category theory or just uh, a path to take within category theory. We can answer that uh, in either direction. Yeah, sorry, Paul. Hi. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe, an, maybe a refinement of saying category theory is hard is to say that maybe it, it, it supports a slightly different learning trajectory than maybe more conventional fields in mathematics. I had I went back and looked this up um, when I was reading this question. There was a in Richard Bird in the beginning of a book called the Algebra of Programming has a statement about he says one one doesn't so much learn category theory as absorb it over a period of time that is kind of something you maybe get used to. And for me at least, that that feels like an accurate description of like my roadmap, which was that I initially felt like I had something which felt at the time like a breakthrough. And in retrospect, I'm like, okay, that got the ball rolling. And for me, what I ended up doing was just, like I am kind of a slow learner, but I am very tenacious. So I just kept getting different category theory books and kind of triangulating across a lot of different voices, a lot of different resources, and just having the same thing explained to me multiple different times. Um, and that sort of cross-referencing over time was at least for me really helpful in sort of annealing my brain to like, think in this other style. But for people who've had more experience actually teaching category theory, I'm wondering if that's, if you've observed that as being general, like, is this, is this an absorptive process or is there uh, other, other kind of learning pathways you've observed? Uh, Eugenia. Thanks. I think it's just always important for us to remember that everyone is different and there is not possibly one roadmap for learning anything. And I don't think category theory is different from any other subject like that. And that mainstream education imposes a roadmap. And usually the roadmap is stupid. And it's like the idea in, in mainstream math education that you have to do a whole semester of algebra, which means what manipulating equations in one variable or something. And that you can't do that. You can't do, you can't progress to, to trig until you can do mental arithmetic. I mean, this is stupid. You can do category theory without knowing any mental arithmetic and without knowing any trig and without knowing any calculus. And so everyone is different. And so for example, some people learn through examples. And so they look at a lot of examples and that's how they learn the theory. Other people learn from theory and they 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 go the other way. And this I've seen this happen at every level. I I remember helping a five-year-old who couldn't do arithmetic because they kept trying to explain it to her using objects and once it wasn't using objects she could do it when it was just numbers and then she could use the numbers to understand the objects and I thought oh she's thinking like an abstract mathematician and so it's just important to not try and impose any kind of order of doing things on anyone some people learn category theory as a piece of algebra and immediately get it. And some people absorb it. Some people learn it through computer science. Some people learn it because they think it's gonna help them solve a problem. Some people learn it because all their friends are doing it. Some people, I mean, there are just so many different directions. And so there's a, there's a diagram I drew at the beginning of my book, The Joy of Abstraction, showing an interconnected network. And that, that the traditional model of math education is a series of hurdles that somebody has declared that we have to jump over this hurdle before we are going to be strong enough to jump over the next, next one. And I strongly object to that. Everything is connected to everything else. And there's practically nothing that you, okay, maybe there's something you have to learn before you can learn something else. But, but I'm just gonna go ahead and say, there's practically nothing that you really have to learn before learning something else. You can learn everything in any order that you want. And, um, I okay. I'm going off on a rant now. Someone else, <laughs> someone else, say something. I mean, maybe this is a good point to broaden the question a bit, and uh, you know, what sort of resources are available currently for self-learning category theory? Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Oliver, let's start with you. Um, but uh, maybe we should highlight uh, the, the book being showed case. Okay, uh, Oliver, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I can speak from my own uh, experience and say that, you know, there is a growing 
community of people, uh, especially certain levels of amateurs making videos about the con uh, topic on YouTube, um, which have gained popularity and certainly have the potential to gain further popularity. Uh, but you certainly have to take those resources with a grain of salt because many times their purpose is entertainment rather than education. And it, it, you know, it's certainly worthwhile uh, to have entertaining content and to be entertained by category theory uh, in this instance. Uh, but the, you have to recognize that that's what they are. Uh, but at the same time, there is the benefit that these creators are often more in tune with what their audience are asking and what they want to know about category theory. So I think if you're right at the beginning and haven't had any real experience with mathematics in an academic setting, then I think taking some of those resources might be a gentler introduction. Uh, but obviously that's from my own experience. Great, thanks, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to second uh, Eugenia's <laughs> comment that I, I think this, the joy of abstraction, I think has really changed the landscape in terms of the available literature on this. Um, I feel like I could talk for 20 minutes about, but not just the clarity and like level of the book, but also I think certain specific pedagogical choices that you made, I think I really admire. Um, in particular, there's a ton of talking in that book about why I use this term and not this term. And that kind of self-reflection is something that a self-learner is normally not exposed to in a textbook. Um, and I think calling out things that are overly pedantic, which is a persistent communication problem with the subject. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe one last thing to admire, I think, is just in the introduction, you, you talk about the difference between productive and uh, receptive mathematics, I think you say, which is to say like a lot of myself included, but a lot of people I know are really interested in mathematics, not because they're trying to be participants in the creation of mathematics, but just as appreciators of this kind of thinking and just a beautifully constructed thought. And I think both like giving a name to that was been very helpful for me. And I think the book is very much obviously written um, with the idea of a receptive audience in mind. So I think to me, like I, you know, I, I read Awadi, that was how I got started. So I had a, a for me, that was a very steep climb. And I think the best thing I can say about this book is that this book would have saved me a ton of time. And, and like the effort I was ready to exert would have been much more rewarded by this book if it had existed like five or six years ago. So that would be like, I would direct everyone to like start here. Um, uh, thanks, Paul. Eugenia. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kind words. And I'm glad that you appreciate it. I just wanted to, to make the comment that People have been trying to teach themselves category theory forever, right, since the beginning of the invention of category theory, because when it was first in, in, introduced, there weren't any courses because it was so new. And then even when there were courses in it, most people didn't have access to them. And so even when I started, which, uh, despite my great advanced age, was only about 25 years ago, I met so many people who had learned category theory just by buying categories for the working mathematician and trying to read it. And my mind absolutely boggled how anyone did that. And so I thought, well, I really wanted to write a book that would be more uh, helpful. And then some people wrote some fantastic books, including Audi and Emily's book and Tom Leinster's book. And that kind of took things a bit earlier on, but it still required people to be familiar with mathematical writing and math textbooks. And it sort of didn't, those books don't assume mathematical background, but they assume familiarity with the genre of math. And um, it's, but no, at the time, I don't think any of us were really imagining that people outside math were trying to learn category theory. And then when Simon Willerton and I started making Katz's videos in 2007, we weren't aiming at anyone in particular. We were just aiming at people trying to learn category theory, which we thought was mathematicians and physicists. And then all these Haskell programmers popped out of the woodwork and go, went, oh, someone's explaining monads. And we were, we were going, what, what's Haskell? Why are programmers trying to learn category theory? And so the whole time there's just, it's just a wonderful, I think it's wonderful that as there are more resources, more people get into category theory and then yet more people want to get into category theory. And so I wrote this book specifically to help people who don't have familiarity with the, the way math is done, which is why the whole first eight chapters is just about 
it just a gentle lead into how we even do math and how we write about it and how to read it. And I really didn't want to put the definition of a category. I think it's on page 120 or something because there's just a big buildup. And I hope so that I also just want to point out that the Topos Institute is running a book club on it where everyone can ask questions every week and on each chapter. So we're going chapter by chapter each week. And I'm absolutely loving this as a format. And then I just make a video and answer everyone's questions. The questions are fantastic. I can take, take as much time to answer the questions as I want because it's just a video and it's going to be on YouTube. And uh, I recommend, I would urge um, future people who write books and who really want to help people make it through their books to try and do something like that, possibly with the Topos Institute. So thank you, Topos Institute. And thank you to everyone who submits questions. And I'm I'm so heartwarmed that there are so many people who want to want to ask questions and who want to learn category theory. So it's all uh, it's all it's, it's all great. Great. Uh, so I mean we've mentioned uh, videos, we've mentioned books. I mean another great learning resource, I think, are blogs. And a, a kind of fun thing about blogs is they're often written by somebody who's learned the subject uh, fairly recently themselves. Um, Tidane, I don't know if you're comfortable being put on the spot to describe some of the experience. What led you to start your blog? Sort of how, how close to the material were you when you were writing it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Emily, for bringing that up. Right. So I have... Um this blog, Mathema, which I started in grad school. So I don't know how helpful it has been or could be to self-learners um, because I was in a pure math program, you know, studying category theory, you know, with other graduate students and with, with a, you know, professors, faculty there. Um, but one of the things, one of my main reasons for really starting Mathema and, uh, focusing so much on category theory is that I found it really hard and it was challenging. And I remember the first time I ever heard the definition of a category and a functor, I thought this is the worst, like this is why people don't like math. That's really what I thought. I was like, see, <laughs> this is why nobody likes math because it was so confusing and it just kind of felt yucky and repulsive. So it wasn't until a year after that first encounter when I saw the kind of 30,000 foot viewpoint that that language gives you and it's kind of empowering then then like the sparks went off and I was like oh my gosh this is amazing I have to tell people about this so one of the things that I that motivated me to, to start Mathema but also to focus so much on category theory is that I felt very strongly that there were fantastic ideas that were hidden behind this very like thick brick wall of formality and jargon and like just words that obfuscate the beautiful ideas beneath. So one thing, so I, I sort of had to do two things. Number one, I had to like break down that wall myself so that I could see the ideas. And then number two, I wanted to like reduce the cognitive load for other people. So I wanted to try to rewrite about those ideas, but like in a way that I wish it had first been explained to me. But I, you know, I wasn't writing for self as I was kind of imagining, oh, there's like lots of other people that are also, you know, in either undergrad or graduate school learning this. Um, I was thinking, it, like putting myself in their shoes. If I wanted to help other students, this is how maybe I would explain what a category is or what a functor is. Um, and so my, so the Mathema articles maybe kind of sit in between like non-math majors or folks that come from other disciplines to, you know, like professional mathematicians. So it's somewhere in between. Um, so, you know, if I were to try to make it even more accessible, maybe I'll have to start like another blog <laughs> in another life or something. But yeah, those are, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Emily. Sure. I mean, what's so wonderful about blogs is it's it's something sort of anybody uh, can do. And in that, uh, you know, I, I think often people write the exposition they wish they had had when they were trying to learn. So if you're somebody who... Uh, you know, has a, a slightly different background and tied to Nate's blog doesn't really speak to you, but you get to the point where category theory is starting to sing, you know, maybe that's the opportunity to start your own blog to help those folks who are in your orbit. Um, let me bring a new question in and then Paul, you can let me know if you want to still jump in. So, um, you know, so Eugenia mentioned that if you're uh, reading along in the Joy of Extraction book club and you have any questions, you should just send them to her, which is wonderful. But let's say you're, you're reading a different book or you don't have direct access 
to the author, um, where can you get uh, your questions answered? And maybe these are technical questions. You read the definition of a monad and you don't understand it. Or maybe these are questions about like, why should you care about such? So somebody wrote to us to ask why I care about slice categories. They come up early and often in many textbooks, but uh, you know, why, what is this abstraction for? Why are people so excited about them? So how, how do you get your questions answered if you're not in a book club? Obviously, if you're in the book club, you should ask the question. So I, I don't mean to uh, discount that method at all. Uh, Eugenia, please. I think that's a really good question. And that one of the things that's really important when learning anything is learning how to learn and that that we all become self learners in the end, right, because we all exit, probably exit educational institutions if we were ever in them and then hopefully we carry on learning for the rest of our lives because hopefully we have figured out how to learn things and that you know what the internet's great that the if you can figure out how to ask the internet things then then you're on the way to really great things because there's tons of stuff on the internet and because wonderful people have written loads of blogs and when I don't understand something which is often all the time I just ask the internet and it's great because then you don't have to sort of feel embarrassed by asking someone a question that everyone's going to think that you're really stupid for asking and then someone may have written a blog and it may be from 15 years ago but it's still really helpful and the other the of course you have to be able to tell what's good information and what isn't good information which is a very important skill in life anyway and the thing is that there's there's loads of math and category theory out there that's that's really quite good plus people are very there are some friendly people on social media who, for example, um, us, some of us are on social media and answer questions. And if we can't answer the question, then we'll, we may direct someone to where they can. And it would be great. That's why I think it would be great if maybe somewhere like the Topos Institute, by Topos Institute people, I'm making a direct suggestion that we have, there are regular ones of these where everyone can submit questions and then maybe a panel can be convened that can that covers the questions because I know we've got a bit of a hole in our panel today because there are some questions that came in about computer science and none of us uh, none of us professes to feeling very um, well equipped to answer those but I think that would be a great model where regularly everyone can submit quite any questions and then a panel is convened that can answer them and that I think that would be a great addition to the landscape. Paul. Um, I, I had a, another maybe more radical suggestion that I, I, I had an experience this last year where um, it wasn't category theory, but I, I realized for some work I was doing, I needed to understand a mathematical subject much better than I did. Um, and I kind of needed to understand it in a hurry. So I actually ended up hiring a tutor, um, a sort of a math PhD who specializes in um, adult learning of college level math. And um, I had never, like, it just wasn't my model for tutoring it was like a remediative thing you would do if you were struggling with a class. But I was like, actually doing a personalized course with a professional introduced two things into self-study that were really valuable. One was just some kind of accountability, actually just did a lot for my ability, like my ability to focus because I don't want to look foolish when I'm talking to somebody. But also just, I was surprised by how much of the subject matter is actually telegraphed in a kind of casual conversation with an expert. So those are things you're getting in a more formal university environment, but it is a fact that those things can be purchased in miniature if you want to put those kinds of resources into it. Um, and uh yeah, that's anyway, just to say that that, that is an option that's out there um, if you really want to get, you know, like if I were going to learn piano, I would hire a piano teacher and you can actually approach this stuff in the same way. So. Yeah, and one on one, I'm sure that's really wonderful. Um, uh, Titan A. Yeah, another thing, um, speaking of online resources. So I, I haven't um, logged into this for a while, but I think there's a category theory Zulip channel, and I don't know if there's a thread on there for, you know, if you've read category theory in context and you have questions about other people that have read the book, maybe there is, or if there's not, someone could start that. But so there are online forms. I heard, I don't know, I'm not on Reddit, but I think there's like a category theory Reddit group, maybe. So so there are maybe online forms that exist already where people can like right now submit questions and see if there are um, folks who have those answers. I don't have the links, but maybe if someone does, they could share it, or maybe we could do that later. Oh yeah, thanks, David. 
Great, Eugenia. Um, thanks, Tyler. I just want to add that I have not been on those channels either, but I have heard some reports that they are a bit um, not necessarily always friendly, which is a real shame. And so this is something that I, we could dream of in the future because I would never dream of asking a question on any online forum about category theory because the ones I've seen, including Math Stack Exchange and Math Overflow, unfortunately have been quite hostile. And when I tried to ask some questions a long time ago, they were very hostile and I felt very insulted. And, um, and this is despite the fact that I am in fact an expert in the field. It was a very male dominated environment and it was very what I would call ingressive where there was a lot and the whole system is set up with kudos points or something where you build up your kudos and and it's all designed for the com competitive it seemed very ego driven and I didn't like it at all and I would love there to be a different model I tried to set one up I tried to set up a congressive discord and it was quite nice and it was uh, it, and it was very we had moderated it very heavily in there very um very clear guidelines about congressiveness uh there were still some infractions and it was still very male dominated and so i don't really know what to do about that except my that's why i included my point about is it that uh, that so many women are so overloaded with domestic and emotional labor that they just don't have any space i don't i don't know about that but i i will say that if there if we could figure out how to make a congressive friendly forum for people to ask questions then that would be wonderful You know, and I think this is, I mean, that, that's a very important point, of course. And I think this is something that everybody who participates in whatever channel can help with. Um, you know, so, I mean, certainly on Reddit, you downvote <laughs> a comment, you know, if you're, um, you could flag it for a moderator or something like that. Um, you know, also, uh, um, you know, I, I think I, it, you know, this is, of course, easier, the sort of longer you've been in the space and the more, Sort of socially connected you are, but um, you know I, th I think um, it's very possible to you know mathematical norms I, I view of as being something local here. You know, sort of social norms are sort of local, and so um, you know if you uh, you know as, as Eugenia suggested, you could you know create your own online space, or if you're in an online space, you know try and create it in the image that you want it to be by um, you know responding <laughs> kindly to questions, saying you know. Somebody asks a question, say, no, I had that question too. Um, you know, things like that, I think, uh, you know, can hopefully positively influence behavior. Um, okay, so uh, another question we received was about examples. Uh, so uh, are there examples or classes of examples which best illustrate the widest range of category theoretic phenomenon? So if there's, uh, you've come across some new concept in category theory and you're trying to see how it manifests. Are there some typical examples you should look for? Or does this change with the thing that you're trying to learn? Sorry, go, <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, I think I'm, I, I, I'm sorry I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it really depends. It's different for everyone, right? Because there are so many examples from different places and it's a real mistake to think that there's some canonical set of examples that everyone should know. And I think this is something that held back category theory uh, education for a really long time. The idea that you have to know all of these examples from upper level undergraduate pure math before you can possibly learn category theory because all of the examples from category theory come from those things. And so I've been teaching it to art students who don't know any undergraduate math and mostly they have forgotten or deliberately run away from everything they learned in math in school because they hated it so much. And so they maybe can't even do basic arithmetic and that's great. Um, I love it when people can't do ba basic arithmetic and because who needs basic arithmetic? We've all got calculators on our phones. And so so my examples, I all take from from real life. And I mean, real, real life. I mean, politics and social justice and current events. And yes, that does wind some people up because some people don't want to talk about politics in math. And I would just like to say that if you don't think math should be political, that is itself a political stance. So you're still being political. Anyway, then there are there are examples, there are examples everywhere. And so it really depends where you're coming from.
So a related question to the examples question is about exercises. So um, if you're the type of self-learner who wants to uh, do some exercises while you're learning uh, category theory, where are some good places to find some? Or maybe exercises with solutions or some sort of worked examples. Um, so you're not just sort of reading, but you're um, more engaged. Paul, please. <laughs> um, well, so I, 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 I was, it's funny, I was going, I was kind of pooling all the resources I've learned from, and it really impressed on me how much my own exposure to category theory is from resources of people generated by people on this panel. But um, I, yeah, uh, Ty Danae's topology uh, from a categorical perspective book. Um, I read this last year and I realized it was filling up gap that I hadn't realized I had, which is that I've been reading a lot of books about category theory. And what you get with those is a, a variety of examples that are sort of individuated, like highly granular examples from different mathematical theories. And this book to me was, it was one subject matter entirely treated from a categorical point of view. And that to me was like, I feel like I was seeing something I hadn't seen before, which was a sustained treatment that relied on these tools in an extensive way. Um, I don't know if that's exactly worked examples, but it, it, it helped me understand how this stuff is actually like deployed at length and live in an actual academic setting. So I, I do recommend that book as being kind of a focused um, subject matter with this with this toolkit. Uh, Eugenia, please. I'd just like to add that in The Joy of Abstraction, I do work through a lot of examples and I specifically didn't put exercises in because I think it's really off-putting to people who aren't like that to say, now you have to do these exercises, especially if that what follows is then dependent on you having done the exercise. Because if you're stuck, then what do you do uh, if there's no book club to help you? And so I really wanted to make it clear that you don't have to sit and work through exercises. Because personally, as, an, as a student, I never found working through exercises in the slightest bit helpful to learning anything at all. Um, and so I specifically wanted to show that you don't have to do that. Look, I became a category theorist. I did not, I did not learn by working through examples. I wound up a lot of tutors by refusing. Oliver. Yeah, I'd just like to echo that sentiment um, from Eugenia there. Um, so in my experience, uh, where I did a lot of the exercises that I learned category theory um, was from Tom Leinster's Basic Category Theory, um, which is, is a very good book, but it, the examples still felt like quite a difficult jump to make. Um, some were quite easy, some were very hard, and it was in some sense quite difficult to determine which was which and which were necessary and which were you know, just recreational stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it, it would definitely be good to, yeah, it, it's definitely good to have um, some more accessible examples somewhere and some exercises that really don't make you feel worse for not being able to do them uh, in a way. Because once you, when you see just a, a massive list of exercises and you, you can only complete one or two, it definitely feels like I don't understand this and it can be very off-putting for moving forward. All right, so we have a variety of questions, um, you know, about uh, self-learners who are coming from a particular background and are curious about how category theory relates to some other subject that they know already. Um, so the first of these is, uh, are there resources for understanding the relationship between philosophy and category theory? Paul, please. Um, so I'm not sure if this is related to philosophy generally, but in terms of philosophy of mathematics and, and foundations, um, there's an article I really like by Barry Mazur called When is One Thing Equal to Some Other Thing? Um, and uh, I think it was written to commemorate Saunders McLean's uh, passing. And it, it is um, sort of as the title suggests, he's sort of the first few pages of this, he talks about um, this idea that when you do mathematics and you say this is equal to that, unless it's a tautology like A equals A, you are really saying that two things that are different are equal and that there's this slippery philosophical thing you're doing where you're, you're saying that these are different representations for the same idea 
Um, and he suggests that category theory kind of elegantly sidesteps those philosophical issues by centering on a notion of equivalence as opposed to strict equality. Um, and I really like this article. Like I read this almost at the beginning of trying to learn this stuff. And I was very intrigued by that as like the philosophical setup. Um, and then the math started and I was just, I couldn't proceed. Um, but uh, I, it, the, it, I liked the voice of it, right? It was written in, I don't know, this very like urbane style. Like I, I it was like having category theory explained to you by a uh, like a mathematically knowledgeable humanities professor. <laughs> like he makes like a Proust reference when he's introducing set. And like in terms of reading lots of different things, I feel like this isn't a very distinctive voice that 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 I that I liked. But what happened was I'd go like you know study more formally somewhere else, and then I would come back to this article every so often. And each time I did, I found I could get like a little further into it. So for me, it ended up being like kind of a benchmarking tool in a way. I was like, how 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 far can I get now? Um, and it did feel like a big breakthrough for me when I was the day I was able to kind of read it uh, to the end and feel like I was more or less getting um, what he was talking about. So it, it is both like, I think it's it, the trajectory is, I think, very similar to the joy of abstraction and that it, it starts from basically from scratch and then just makes a direct line for the Yonita Lemma. But along the way, there's a lot of commentary about what all of this means um, in regards to mathematical foundations, which I think is a really nice kind of contextualizing content to have along with that. So I, I really recommend that article. Uh, maybe I'll jump in here to add that with a, with a group of philosophers, um, I uh, read several of the essays in Elaine Landry's Categories for the Working Philosopher, um, or we sort of read them together. And it was an interesting experience, but, you know, really revealed that everybody comes with to the table with different areas of expertise. So um, what we got out of them, what, which we discovered in the discussions of very, very, very different things. There were bits that you know, the mathematicians understood a lot more readily than the philosophers and vice versa. But um, I, th I think that also um, illustrates something that I think is important. Uh, you know, whenever you're trying to learn something that's sort of a bit out of your wheelhouse, um, you know, the, the, the default is going to be, you know, relatively, uh, I mean, you, you can't come in expecting to understand absolutely everything. And, um, you know, but you can still get a lot out of it and, um, you know, get inspiration and feel uh, enriched by the experience, even if um, you you also feel like you might want to come back to the article in a few years and see if you can understand it more deeply then. Um, Eugenia, please. I just want to, to back up what you both just said, because it's a, I think it's a really important point to know that we don't understand anything, and that often that people who think that they're not good at math think that they don't understand things, but people who are mathematicians also think they don't understand anything. The people who think they understand things are just deluded. They're the ones who actually don't understand math if they think they do. And so I just love what Paul said about uh, reading the intro to that paper and then being unable to proceed once the math started. Because honestly, that's how I feel when I read most math papers. It's like, I can read the I can read the first two sentences and then the math starts, I'm like, oh, done. Like in most math talks as well. The, the, the idea is, oh, and then the actual things start. and. And, and it's all over. And so sometimes non-mathematicians say to me, oh, I'd, I'll never be able to understand your research. And I'm like, most, most category theorists can't understand my research. I, I don't understand my research. No, nobody understands, no, none of us understands anything. Wonderful, Oliver. Yeah, I'd just a very short uh, addition to that. There's an excellent quote by um, John von Neumann, who many regard as one of the smartest people of all time, um, saying that, you know, in mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get more familiar with it, uh, which I think uh, certainly echoes that sentiment quite strongly. Yeah, I think there's something about the mathematical mindset, which is that you're not satisfied with your level of understanding. You always feel like you could go deeper. Um, okay, so uh, we also had several questions from the computer science community. So, you know, what courses or maybe lecture videos or textbooks would you recommend for getting started with category theory from a CS background? And maybe a related question, uh, is this worth the time and effort? So, um, you know, do you, will it give you a measurable improvement in performance or in, uh, you know, sort of understanding what you're doing, the simplicity of your programs? Uh, Oliver, please. 
Uh, so as one example I saw recently um, was um, something from, I, th I think I've got the name here and I'm going to butch butcher the pronunciation, um, but Giuseppe Maggiore, uh, who demonstrated how to construct categorical constructions in TypeScript. And that was beginning from a kind of programming standpoint. Uh, so I can provide a link to that in the chat in a minute. But um, I think that in my experience, there have been many people I've seen who use kind of categorical or functional programming concepts in computer programming without really realizing that they are uh, the, the categorical basis that they have. Um, so it's it's actually relatively easy for those people to kind of sneak into the category theory world uh, from that perspective because they've been using these ideas so long and haven't really realized that, oh, this is actually what they're based on. So that's quite a cool thing. Eugenia. I think there's an interesting broader point here about why we bought, why we do anything. Why do we learn anything? And if you're, if you're a computer scientist or a programmer who's thinking of learning category theory in order to improve your, the efficiency of your programs later, then that's a, such a different motivation to why I do things that, um, that I don't know if, I don't know if anyone successfully learns category theory in order to become more efficient at, at, at their job. Um, I, I think that if you don't enjoy it as you go along, then you might not get very far. But, that, but maybe that's just me. I'm completely incapable of learning how to do something if I don't enjoy it, which is why I'm completely incapable of playing sport. I mean, I probably could. I'm probably physically capable of playing sport, but I hate it so much that I'm completely emotionally incapable of engaging with it. And the same is true of other things like, I don't know, physics. Uh, sorry, physicists, but I just, I'm sure I could do physics because I can do math, but I just don't enjoy it at all. And so I can't do it. And so I don't know, maybe there are people out there who can do things they don't enjoy, who can learn things they don't enjoy. I can only do things I don't enjoy if something really terrible will happen to me if I don't do it, like my taxes. But apart from that, I, I can't. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I feel like I should also just mention that all of us discussed this beforehand and none of us felt really uh, well equipped to speak informedly about computer science and category theory. Um, but I, there, there are two things I wanted to say. One is that I, I had a good friend who was actually a, a math PhD, but was also just very proficient at a functional programming language called Haskell. And Haskell, in a lot of ways, was like one of the first, I think, really applied category theory uh, instances that came up in the 70s was the realization that you could design a programming language with a type system that was very much like the category of sets and functions, and that you could look at this um, as a programming paradigm. And he, it was really interesting to talk with him about math, because what he would do is whenever he had a question or something he was confused about, he would actually just open up a, a Haskell console and do some type checking or something. And I just have a very vague sense of what he was doing exactly, but he could kind of use this as an interactive instance of set that he could like query as an Oracle. And that like underwrote a lot of his understanding and thinking about math. Um, and I certainly don't have that competency, but I would recommend anyone who's learning this, who's getting stuck on the math part, why don't you shift lanes and try and learn some Haskell? Because again, the more points of view you have on the subject, I think the, the better you're going to be at sort of converging on the, the, the core idea. And then there is one book, I, I, I feel like Vanna White, I just keep holding these things up. There is a uh, category theory for programmers by Bertoj Maluski. I think the, the audience for this is, I think, just people who already know functional programming but haven't realized its connection to mathematics. And this book is absolutely charming just because he has all of these watercolor il illustrations of like pigs and arrows and the thing. I, it's a beautiful book. It's really structured up to a point and then kind of goes off in 100 directions at once. Uh, but uh, again, really, really good to have on the bookshelf with other things in terms of learning the subject. Great, Titanay. Yeah, speaking of books, um, this this came to mind as we were talking. So there's another book that came out last year, I think, called Theoretical Computer Science for the Working Category Theorists by Nosen Yanofsky. Um, I do not have a computer science background, so I don't know if that would be helpful for folks who are interested. And also, I guess it's written for category theorists. But if you have you know a little bit of background in both and want to get a 
a, a more comprehensive view, maybe that book might be helpful. I could put it in the chat. Great, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, you know, in a weird way, mathematics students are often among the self learners of category theory, just because it's not a standard piece in the mathematics curriculum. So uh, here's a controversial question. I'm expecting we'll have multiple answers from the panel. Um, when should a mathematics student self study category theory? How much abstract algebra or other areas should you study before category theory and understand? in order to understand the most of the typical examples used in an introductory text. What kind of background in mathematics would make learning category theory interesting? Um, Eugenia, please. Of course, I'm sure you can all figure out what I'm gonna say. So first of all, I've learned to remove the word should from my entire vocabulary. I don't think there is any should to anything. There's just consequences. So everyone's different and it depends when you want to. And if you want to, one of the reasons I wrote The, the Joy of Abstraction is because I wanted to give a resource to people who had not covered any topics in undergraduate mathematics, because many of the other texts do rely on topics in undergraduate mathematics. And I don't think it's necessary because I didn't, I mean, I had done an undergraduate degree when I learned category theory, but I didn't understand any of it until I did category theory. And then I suddenly understood my whole undergraduate degree in retrospect. And I've been teaching category theory, like I keep saying, to art students for the last eight years. And I also teach it to high school students. I do it uh, in a high school summer camp. And so I, I introduce the topics in undergraduate mathematics from scratch as examples to, to as a place to, to apply some of the things that we've already studied. And so um, that is a resource, even though many of the other resources do somewhat rely on other branches of undergraduate mathematics, the joy of abstraction tries not to. Of course, it will help if the more you've done before, it may help, but it also might not because you might have done it so differently um, that, that it's completely different. It's like the fact that when I talk about functions with my art students, some of them say they can't remember anything about functions from school. And I actually think that's better because functions as done in school are so different from functions done from a categorical point of view that it's probably just better if they've forgotten everything that they've done in school. Oliver. Yeah, so I've, obviously I can only speak from my personal experience here. And I think it's fair to say I took tri quite a traditional um, route through mathematics, mathematics education, but for me personally, I don't think category theory would have been as valuable as it has been without having some mathematical footing to stand on first. Um, I'm, as, as I said, I'm aware that could just be my perspective, but what, what it is in, in my experience is that it's a force multiplier for mathematics understanding um, in that I could take something that I'd already learned in one area or discipline and use that, and category theory would provide the links to be able to use that as a starting point for other disciplines later on. So as I went further and further through my uh, degree and masters, um, once I had learnt category theory, it kind of became a game of, oh, spot the category, spot the functor. Just like, yeah, that, that's a category there, that's a functor there. I suddenly understand this a lot more than I, had pre uh, I would have otherwise because I have this footing in other modules and I have this mental framework from, from other modules that I can apply. Great. I, I like the uh, comment that, um, you know, who are we to tell anybody when they should do anything <laughs> at all? Um, but if I were designing a mathematics curriculum and had space to put category theory in somewhere, the, the place I would like to put it is as a sort of capstone undergraduate course or beginning graduate course. Um, for a capstone undergraduate course, I think it's a wonderful way to revisit all of the mathematics you've learned, kind of as Oliver and was alluding to. And um, it's a wonderful way to revisit and, uh, you know, kind of meet all your old friends again and uh, understand them better the second time around. Um, and then as a beginning graduate course, I think at that level, you know, when you're preparing to kind of go more deeply into mathematics and you'll be learning a lot of things very quickly and it's going to be very, very hard. I really think having this kind of force multiplier tool in your toolkit at that stage. Um, it really does, in my view, make learning the more advanced topics a bit easier. Um, Eugenia. I would add it as a capstone high school class. Um, and because I think that the ideas are so vivid and so 
uh, amenable to thinking about everything in life. And you don't have to do it rigorously, right? No, because nothing is done rigorously in high school. And so why, why do we wait for category theory? Because we can't do it rigorously yet when we do all this stupid calculus and trig and stuff completely unrigorously. Why not demonstrate show the ideas of category theory and just plant those seeds instead in high school and then do it again a bit more rigorously as a capstone undergrad. Well, but I also think as a sort of first year general liberal arts, because I've been teaching it as liberal arts for eight years, for everyone who, who is not going to be a math major, but make it available as an option, again, not necessarily rigorously, and then do it rigorously. So it can be done at all sorts of different levels. And as Paul said about my receptive and productive thing, I think that that mathematicians have been making a huge mistake for ages, thinking that math should only be done rigorously and it's only worth doing it if you can do exercises and write proofs. Because there are so many other things where we don't say that. You know, we 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 have music appreciation classes and you can go to an art gallery and look at art even if you can't paint at all. And I think it's really important to, to offer that as a way of interacting with math and in particular category theory as well. Wonderful. So uh, the theme of the next set of questions are sort of, uh, you know, broader motivation for studying category theory. So um, speaking generally, um, you know, what are some insights that the categorical approach has given you? Um, where do you think these ideas might be going? Um, what are some of the utilities, if we want to use that word, of category theory? You know, sort of what what's it, what is it all for? Why are we all here? You know, why you know why did this inspire us? Yeah. Uh, Paul, um, actually, can I defer to Eugenia on this one first? Certainly. Thanks. Well, this is something I talk about a lot in all the public speaking I do and all the writing I do about. It's, and it goes back to the why do we do anything question. And I think this is one of the things that math education is, has been really mistaken about for a long time, making it very, very utilitarian and pretending that we do math because it's useful. And I think that it is useful, but either we need to have a have a have admit that it's other things as well, or we need to have a much less utilitarian definition of useful, if that's not just too many words in one sentence, because, because it's often useful because it just helps us use our brains well. And to me, that's the most important thing of all. And if, it, if we can use our brains better, generally, then we can do everything better. Of course, then there's the why are we trying to do things better at all? And that's sort of related to we're trying to make progress. And that's kind of related to colonialism, which is kind of related to destroying the environment. So it's not even clear that we should be doing that. Like, why aren't we just learning to be nice to people and feed hungry people? And and so if I think about that too hard, I just sit down and go, oh, none of us should do category theory. We should just learn to stop breaking people's hearts, be kind and and have better food distribution around the world. But aside from that, it's to, I find it's to help me just think more clearly about everything from math to human interrelationships to how I want society to be better to, to every aspect, every aspect of my life. But that's not why I did it. I started doing it because I just loved it on impact so much. I found it to be so beautiful, the most beautiful map I'd ever seen. It was what I had dreamt of without ever really knowing it all the way through school when I hated every math class because it just seemed so pedantic. And I just held out this belief that there was something better out there. And all the way through undergrad, when I was sweating blood and not understanding anything and just desperately trying to make it through somehow so that I could get to do research in something that I didn't know existed yet. And then I saw category theory and I thought, oh, that's what I've been wait That's what I've been seeking all along. And now obviously everyone has a different reaction to it. And and some people hate it on impact and only come to it later. And so this is just, to, again, to say that people have very different motivations for doing it. And I don't think we should make any assumptions about anyone. But the best thing that my art students say to me is when they say that they wish that they had seen this kind of math in high school, because it would have completely changed their whole life interaction with, with math and probably mainstream education as well. Oliver. So I, I just have um, an example from my own life uh, related to this question um, in a way. So I was speaking to my friend who had done a degree in speech and language therapy, uh, which I don't think anyone can dispute is a very important thing 
for society. You know, it's helping people with speech disorders um, live a better life. Uh, and she asked me, you know, what did you actually do with your dissertation? Because I don't understand it. And so I was explaining, well, category theory is in some, some sense a way of linking together lots of different bits of maths and understanding the underlying patterns of that and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, she just said, well, that just sounds abstract and useless. Uh, and then, so I, I knew that she had done a module in linguistics as part of her degree. So I, I uh, vaguely remembering some links I'd seen between category theory and linguistics said, well, it's got applications in linguistics. Uh, and then she said, but linguistics is abstract and useless too. Um, and I think there's definitely an obstacle um, in that regard in kind of getting people to change their mindset of what is valuable to society and valuable to learn. Uh, and it's some, it's a question I've thought about a lot, but I don't really feel like I have an, a proper answer for myself aside from I just enjoy it. Uh, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's nothing for me but to try and echo, I think, the the sort of emotional statements that a lot of other people have been making. Um, for me, it was like, I've always been interested in mathematics, and I often make the analogy that it would be like, imagine you were interested in biology your whole life, and you studied it in college, and you did field research, and meanwhile, you'd always hear about this thing called the theory of evolution, and everyone would be like, oh, yes, but it's very abstract, and then if you're me and you're like in your mid thirties, suddenly you realize like, oh no, you learn this thing and you're like, oh, it's not just another subject. It's like this overarching framework within which everything else makes this new kind of sense. And it was just such an augmentation to something that I already loved. Um, and that was, I just, so there are certain things that are just invisible without this particular lens. And I'm thinking specifically of like knowing what a jointness is, a joint functors and knowing what the Yoni dilemma is and suddenly turning around and being able to see these things all around you. It's like the, the fish that doesn't know what water is, is suddenly appraised of like their context. And I feel like I like knowing this for the same reason I like knowing that the earth is round or that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. It's like, these are these hard won fruits of like human understanding that are just a joy to have on like the intellectual mantelpiece to like regard uh, with, I, I don't know, you, you fall in love with something, you wanna be evangelist for it. Um, I think this is some of the best stuff I know at this point in my life. Um, it, it's it's self-justifying. Uh, great. Uh, tight and A. Um, yes, I just wanted to also lend my voice and, and say, I, I get the question a lot, you know, what good is category theory? Like, why should I invest in it? And I, and I feel a little bit... Um, bad that my my answer is just well I love it <laughs> but that's okay I mean you know maybe that's not a satisfactory answer and that's probably not what people are looking for um one of the things that attracted me to it so I'm a mathematician and I I chose to study that because I just think mathematics in general is beautiful and the way it connects to nature and to the world um is really just mind-blowing to me and so one of the things that I love about category theory is that, I mean, as we all know, it sort of shows you that things that feel disparate and disconnected really aren't in like a very fundamental way they're united. And to me, that's just delightful. Um, and as we're kind of saying so far, maybe that's not quite what people are looking for when they're like, but yeah, what can it be used for? And I never have a good answer for that. Um, but then I also, I, I, I feel like, well, that's okay. Maybe that's okay. I personally don't like mushrooms, for example. And no one will ever convince me otherwise. Like you cannot tell me enough things about mushrooms to ever make me like them, but that's okay. You know, that's just who I am and it is what it is. So um, I don't know if that's helpful. I'm just also agreeing that there's some like something about category theory that, that you know, has attracted us to it. And, and maybe that's like a good thing. And then I, I don't know, it can be hard to think of it and like, yeah, but what is it used for? Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Is it okay that we don't have a good answer for that? Maybe, but Eugenia, you also have a hand raised, so I'll pass it on to you. Thanks. I just wanted to, to say that I think one of the problems with math and math education and math outreach is too many people telling everyone else how important math is and how they really need to be able to do it and how it's really useful. And then showing them bits of math that are not useful to them in the slightest. And that's what most of math education is. And using the wrong notion of useful and especially if you keep going on at someone about how important something is if they're anything like me they just kind of start hating you and start and just want to 
deliberately run in the opposite direction to prove. It's like people keep telling me that exercise will make me feel better. And so I just keep wanting to demonstrate to them how awful exercise makes me feel. And so I what I, I think that Tidane's thing about saying, well, this is why I like it is wonderful. And I always say, I'm not gonna tell anyone they should like it. I'm just gonna say that I'm sorry that you may have had a really bad experience with math in the past. and. I'm going to show you a different kind of math that may be completely different from that and that may help you think about things in a completely different way and if you still don't like math that's fine like you say some people don't like mushrooms and i don't like cinnamon and we can all like different things but if you don't like math because you've seen some really awful stupid kind of math then that's really sad because that's not even math and so i'm going to show you this other kind and i'm going to show you that abstraction doesn't just take us and i'm always saying this this is why this sounds like pre-prepared speech but i say it often in my in my talks that abstraction may seem like it takes us further away from real life but what it does is it enables us to bring more examples in and so differential equations are less abstract but then we can only study things like planes and bridges and electricity and stuff whereas abstract math is so abstract that now we can talk about social privilege and racism and we can understand that the arguments that and so i demonstrate this by by showing uh, uh, that how I how it helps me to understand really difficult arguments in the world around us that other people go and go oh I just can't understand this this and this and I sit down and go well here's how I understand it and then they if they they quite often go oh wow that's given me a lot of clarity about it and then starting from seeing the kind of clarity that it can give about things that they really care about which may well not be planes and and electricity and bridges but if they do care about those social justice issues, then that will give them something to start thinking about to show that abstraction isn't just something that is remote. Of course, yes, there are people who aren't interested in social justice, and my approaches will probably not help them, but but that's okay. I can't help everyone at once. Great. So uh, another question that connects actually to a question that was just asked in the chat is, uh, if you want to know whether category theory can be applied to or maybe better connects to some other subject, how, how would you find that out? And a related question, if you after you've learned some category theory, uh, what can you do with it? Where you, can you practice it? Uh, can you make a living off of it? Um, please go ahead. So the answer to is category theory related to something is yes, because everything is related to everything. And I suppose really the question is, in what way is it related? And the Internet is very helpful with those things. But apart from that, I really just do believe everything is related to everything else. And I I'm, I make good on this by when in when I'm teaching, if whatever my art students are talking about, I never make them give them exercises or make them talk about anything because I feel like everyone's an adult. They can talk about anything they want. And so if I go around the room and they turn out to be talking about something else entirely, I just always relate it to whatever categorical concept that we we were talking about. And I, I can, because I do think everything is related. So I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, whether you can make a living from category theory, well, some of us here make a living from category theory in in various different ways, whether you can, learn category theory from scratch, from outside mathematics, and then make a living from it. Well, I would like to think that there are educational and outreach possibilities. And if in my utopian future, we get more jobs for exposition and outreach, then, then maybe yes. Aside from that, I don't know. I understand that there are people doing category theory as programmers in actual corporate environments. And I believe that those places pay them money. So there is that possibility. Uh, so maybe a related question to that answer. Uh, what are some, I guess not from the monetary perspective necessarily, but you know, what are some open source projects that are accepting contributions for teaching category theory in an accessible manner? I mean, I, I guess you know, mo most of the expository efforts, you know, whether it's Oliver uh, producing his beautiful videos or you know, Tidane writing her her blogs or you know, many of the things that the others of us have done as well are kind of on a voluntary basis. So um, let's say you, all, you want to join, join the team. Uh, what are some suggestions?
Yes, please, Oliver. Yeah, so, I mean, again, um, I'm speaking only about videos here, um, but these days it, it is a, a surprisingly low barrier to entry to make videos about this topic. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's not quite open source in the official sense, but it is something that anyone can work on and anyone can produce content. And the fact there is a low bar barrier to entry can mean that it, it's difficult to discern what is actually the valuable stuff that people are saying and what's just the churn that people are producing. Um, so there's, there's definitely got to be some awareness of that and some awareness of what, yeah, uh, what the distinction is. Um, but I think it's, for me personally, it's been a very fulfilling thing to be able to create these resources and see people engaging with them and see people learning new things out of them that they, ne they'd never even heard of. They didn't even set out to learn category theory. They were just, they just stumbled upon it. Uh, and I think that is something that a lot of other people can get into uh, these days. As I said, it's just, it, it's getting easier and easier to, to do that. Uh, Tyler Ney. So that makes me think of something. Um, here's a thing that doesn't exist, but maybe someone can make, bring this thing into existence. So probably people have heard of Grant Sanderson's three blue, one brown math channel. And for the past two summers, he's had what's called a summer of math exposition, which essentially encourages people from everywhere to create their own explainer videos. And then the idea is not really to like get a prize or something. It's to actually increase the way that math is communicated about different topics and have just people engage in that and have fun. And so, um, there, there are, there's a lot of activity on YouTube from different people submitting different 10, 15, 30 minute explainer videos, but about a bunch of different topics. So now I'm thinking uh, somebody should create like a summer of math exposition at Topos Institute for category theory videos, maybe, or, you know, well, I think that's a great idea. That's a way to like crowdsource and to get people involved. Um, I don't know, something food for thought, maybe. I mean, I think one of the most wonderful things about exposition is how much you learn in the process. You know, I have a whole series of articles that I wrote with the aim of finally understanding topic X. And so, um, you know, uh, even if, you know, the upload fails and the video gets lost, <laughs> you know, you'll have learned something in the process and um, maybe how to upload it without getting it lost or something, but um, great. Okay, so to wrap things up, uh, we also received some category theory questions and we thought it would be fun to uh, answer a few category theory questions. Um, uh, and actually maybe in the interest of time, I'm just going to pick one. And uh, so, so the question is gonna be, uh, why is Yaneda's Lama so important and ubiquitous? And maybe before we start, I, I wanna say that the thing that I tell my students about Yaneda's Lama is, uh, that it's absolutely impossible to understand anything about it when you first see it. And then on your second encounter, uh, you know, maybe you'll understand a little tiny bit more. And then the third encounter is maybe something you'll understand a little tiny bit more. And after about 10 decades, you know, you might start to feel more comfortable, but there's still things to learn. So, um, so please, uh, you know, if this is your first exposure to the Anita Lemma, um, Welcome, and if this is your third exposure, it's, it's great to have you still interested. Um, Eugenia, why don't you start us off? I say that the, what the Yenado Lama is telling us, you know that saying that uh, if, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, right? So what the Yenado Lama is saying is there's something missing from that saying, because it, it has to walk like a duck and talk like a duck, and other ducks have to think it's a duck. That's it. That's that's all I have about that. No, I mean it's not. There's tons of stuff about the Yenada Lemma. But actually, I love what you said about how you don't ever really understand it. You just keep sort of, and maybe this is what Oliver said as well, that you just keep you just get more and more familiar with it. And there's this ridiculous game that that I feel like the Australian category theorists play, which is a kind of how fast can you declare that something is just the Yenada Lemma? And but you can't do it too fast, otherwise no one will believe you. And so I don't know if there are any Radio Four listeners out there. I can see one, maybe. Uh, I think this is like Mornington Crescent, the the game where you have to get to Mornington Crescent by saying Mornington Crescent, but not too soon. Um, and so yes, it can seem extremely it can seem extremely baffling. And uh, but it's 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 a I think it's about 
how, what is it do you really need to know? And that's what I think category theory is about. It's deep down, it's about what, what is really making something work? What do you really need to know in order to make something happen? What really, what really is going on deep down? That's it. Who else has Can I add something else? Sorry. Absolutely. Can I just say that there was a huge long list of technical questions and I think it would be really great if we answered them, even though we're out of time. And I would like to volunteer and I'm not going to volunteer anyone else, but I'd like to volunteer to just hang around on the video and just answer all of them. OK, um, let's uh, that's that's a great suggestion. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on the Yanay dilemma while we're still here? Please, I mean, I guess I'll just say something. I, I think the duck thing is great. So I don't like what can I say that can make that better. But um, one way that I think about it in really simple terms is that people care about things and you want to understand things. And Yoneda, the like, Yoneda Lemon like tells you how to do that. <laughs> I mean, I guess the things are mathematical objects, blah, blah, blah. But why is it so important? And why is it ubiquitous? Because you're interested in stuff. And the Yoneda Lemon is like, oh, Oh, you're interested in stuff, huh? Well, let me tell you how to study them. So then it's not surprising why it comes up everywhere because you're studying things and it instructs you, it informs you, like, here's the special thing to know about this thing. It guides you, it kind of points you. So I think just in like totally non-technical language, maybe that's how you can think about it. Okay, uh, so another question that came up is, uh, what does it even mean for a category to have one object? And is it the same as saying that one is the category with one object and one identity? And are there any examples of this outside of mathematics? Uh, Eugenia, please. I remember when I first encountered the concept of a category with one object, and I felt like I was falling off a tall building. I had so much vertigo, I did not know what's going on. And I think it's really important for all of us to rem remember times when we have felt so much vertigo about exceedingly confusing mathematical topics. And I think I, I tap into that a lot when I'm teaching because I can basically remember my entire life and every single thing I felt all the way through it. I can't remember where I put my watch, but I can remember every like every feeling I have felt. And so I remember every time I felt confused, every time I felt like someone didn't explain something to me enough, every time someone was rude to me, every time someone excluded me, every time someone said something nice to me. And I remember getting completely confused about categories with one object and what on earth the point was. And the thing is a category has objects and it has morphisms or arrows between them. And so just at some very basic level, you can wonder how many objects there are. And if there's only one and that's it, then there's only one and that's a category with one object. And it's really confusing because you can, because it turns into something else. It's like it, there's this miracle, you, major, ma you wave a magic wand and the one object goes away. And category theorists get so comfortable with this concept that, that I think that they forget how confusing that is at first. But there are many of them in everyday life because every time you pick up one object, you've picked up one object and there may be many morphisms from it to itself. So for example, here is my here is my water glass. It is one object, but I could declare that to be a morphism from it to itself every time I turn it round. That's a morphism from it to itself. And as it's round, it happens to be a symmetry. And that is now a category that has one object, but loads and loads and loads of morphisms between it. And it turns out that we can view that differently because once I've declared that that's the object I'm talking about, one of the miracles of category theory is that the rotations all by themselves kind of tell us what that object must have been. And then it, and then we can go, oh, well, 
just the just those moves we did, the ability to do those tells us that it had to be something circular because that's kind of the only thing that has an infinite number of symmetries like that. And then it doesn't really matter whether it was this water glass or some other perfectly symmetrical water glass. And then that's when category theorists sort of put on their category theory hazy glasses and go, oh, well, then it doesn't sort of matter what that object is anymore. But I, I'm not sure if that was exactly what the question was about, but it's I, it's an amazing it's an amazing topic, the category with one object, and I highly, highly recommend getting confused about it because every time you get confused about it, it's a possibility that's potential for more understanding. Paul. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to echo that vivid sense of confusion um, that comes up when I, I remember the, the example I always remember is like a group. Uh, in, in the mathematical sense is a category with one object and all of the morphisms are isomorphisms. And to me, like I could, I, again, you could see, I can, I can go through legalistically and see that the definition of a group and the definition of a category with these constraints on it match up one-to-one, -one, but it's almost like if you're used to group theory, then the whole surface area that you're working with when you're doing proofs about groups is gone when you like, compile it into this one object with, a, with like a keychain with a bunch of key rings on it. And I, to me, I was like, it's like I was reading a group theory book and then a category theorist came up and was like, another way you can look at it is you can rip out all the pages and ball them up and just make a big pile. And I was like, you, you know, technically, yes, I agree that all the same information is there, but the formatting is now very mysterious. Um, and I, I think I was just calling back to what we were saying, I think in earlier questions about just the disorientation of learning category theory is that if there's no way for you to understand yet that there is a general theory of balled up pages from books, but it does exist. And I think that part like that reassurance to the learner that um, this is actually going somewhere, even though it seems like an act of vandalism at the beginning, I think is I just a, a reassurance I wish I had had more of when I was first trying to like make sense of the, the subject. Eugenia. I just wanted to add that that's one of the reasons that it it's not necessarily a bad thing if you haven't studied group theory before you study category theory, because then you can just learn that a group is a category with one object and everything has an inverse, and then you don't have to get confused between that and the other definition of a group that you've already seen. That's a very good point. Um, Okay, so another question. Uh, so I mostly understand that a natural transformation is an arrow between two functors. Uh, um, you know, such that some diagram has to commute, uh, you know, that diagram is in the, the target category of the, the two functors. Um, but uh, what is an example of a natural transformation and like what type of problems does this help someone solve? Um, maybe, okay, go ahead, please. Well, it, dep it depends. So it depends whether you're coming from a mathematical background or not. So I'm going to assume not. And one of the ways I, because natural transformations are related to homotopies, but one of the ways I like to think of them is, is if a line of police are searching a field for some evidence, then what they might well do is, is walk along. And so to make sure that they don't miss any part of it, they stand in a line and then they walk along, but they make sure that they're maintaining the line as they walk along because if they break the line at some point they'll have missed a spot and so but the way that we can think of that is actually that each individual police person is making their own individual path while at the same time we're making a higher dimensional path that is going to make a square because as long as the line doesn't break then will search the entire field. And so if they have to if they have to split up somewhere because there's a pond or something, then we're going to have a problem because we we don't know like what happened in the pond. Maybe that's exactly where everything is. And so that to me is what the idea of a natural transformation is. And what it helps with is it it enable it gives us access to the correct notion of sameness for categories themselves. And because category theory is really concerned with what the right notion of sameness is for different things. And right means something very specific, a little bit philosophical, but it's that we don't want to talk about things being the same when it doesn't matter. Like if, if, if I call something X instead of Y, that's not profound or important or interesting. And so we shouldn't bother with that. Um, whereas if something has really different relationships with other people, it's like if I put on different clothes 
for a different day. I'm still the same person. That shouldn't, we shouldn't call me a different person because I'm wearing different clothes. And so it's all about figuring out what really matters when we're talking about things being the same. And so inside a category, the correct notion of sameness is isomorphism between objects because we have morphisms so that we can say that we don't have to just be stuck with equality because nothing is equal to itself and not anything else except itself. And so then if we're interested in what the correct notion of sameness is for categories, we need another level. And that's what that's what natural transformations gives us. Now, there's quite a big step between that idea and coming up with that definition. But but what I do in I think what I did in my book when I introduced it was introduce it in a bunch of different ways. So one way is by following your nose through those ideas. Another way is by analogy with homotopies, if you've seen homotopies. And um, but if you if you're wondering why what it's for, I think that's what it's for is to get the right level of things. Uh, on the question of sort of what problems do natural transformations solve, uh, an interesting bit of history, there's an argument that the whole subject of category theory exists because there was a problem, uh, a mathematical problem that needed a natural transformation to solve it. And uh, so Eilenberg and McLean were trying to prove that um, one thing was isomorphic to some other thing where isomorphism means this thing is the same in the sense that mathematicians typically uh, regard things as the same. And their idea was to build that isomorphism by sort of patching together some isomorphisms on simpler things. And they weren't uh, convinced that this patching would actually work. Um, and uh, what they proved then is that the um, the smaller isomorphisms uh, assembled into a, a natural, the components of a natural transformation. And um, uh, and then uh, proved that it result is that you can patch them together. So that's um, one reason why the whole subject exists. Um, please, Eugenia. Well, I just realized that um, we reached 90 minutes and I didn't want to put pressure on everyone by my ludicrous suggestion of sitting here and answering all the questions. And so I wonder if we ought to, I, I mean, I'm stepping on your toes now because you're the chair, but I just wondered if, if we should or could, or if it would be a good idea to sort of formally end and so that people can go if they want to. And then anyone who wants to hang around and answer or listen to questions can. Uh, in case it's helpful information, uh, there were two more questions I was planning to ask. So. Oh, okay. Okay, well, of course, everyone should feel free to drop off, including our, our panelists, who we will thank uh, if, if you do have to disappear. Um, but uh, there's a question. So, um, you know, uh, why are right adjoints less frequently found than left? Or why are left adjoints less frequently found than right? Uh, depending on sort of which side of the bed you woke up this morning, is there an obstruction for constructing the right adjoint given a left adjoint or a left adjoint given a right adjoint? Uh, what's the deal? Yes, Eugenia. So first, I just want to reassure. I mean, I do see quite a lot of category theorists in this in this um, Zoom, but I just also want to reassure everyone that we were definitely not expecting everyone to be here at the level of asking questions about the existence of adjoints. And if you don't know what they are, it's fine. And also, if you have if you don't understand what the question is saying, that's also fine. I'm not sure I understand what the question is saying, and probably even Emily herself doesn't understand quite what the question is saying. Um, and it's interesting because, well, as you might be able to guess from the words, left and right adjoints go in pairs. And something is a left adjoint precisely if it has a right adjoint, and something is a right adjoint precisely if it has a left adjoint. Plus, by duality, every left adjoint is a right adjoint if you kind of dualize everything. And so there is a sense in which and I've been thinking about this, there is a sense in which there might be exactly the same number of left adjoints and right adjoints everywhere. Um, and I was wondering if there was anything else that's like that, like, are there the same number of younger siblings as there are older siblings? Because you're only a younger sibling if you have an older sibling. I haven't quite got my head around, around that yet. But um, I, I think that 
but left and right, they're kind of unfortunate terms. I can never remember which is which, except by the following amazing mnemonic that was given to me by Tom Lanster when he was my supervisor for category theory and as a master student, which is that um, left free free functors are left adjoints because freedom, you know, like anyway, the way I actually remember it is that free has four letters and so does left, and so that's why free functors are left adjoints. Um, which is one of those things that sometimes you have to do uh, to remember things. But I think that forgetful, I think that the forgetful side is more obvious and that often what we're trying to do is show that there is a free functor at all. And because forgetting stuff, well, we all forget stuff, right? I think forgetful functors are really, really, really everywhere because you just forget things. And that's, that's why they're all over the place. Whether you can reconstruct them again once you've forgotten them, that's like finding things that you've lost. And so I think it's much harder to do that um, than, than forget things. Paul. Um, I think I just wanna say that it seems like quite a shame to be talking about these content questions with Emily Real in the room and not be able to direct any of them to her. <laughs> So I, I it's okay, I, but I, I, I would say like, I, I, if you do have anything to add to these, I would be very curious to hear what you have to say, Emily. Um, thanks for that encouragement, but um, I'm, I'm quite happy. Uh, so final question, uh, and, and again, the, this uses words that not everybody knows, but somebody asked and we're here to help, so we're gonna answer. Um, where can I learn about monoidal categories, string diagrams, enriched categories? Uh, this particular questioner is interested in both precise details, like uh, the correctness of the string diagrams, and also how you would choose the correct enrichment in any given application. There are so many monoidal categories out there, and I can absolutely echo that sentiment. Uh, Oliver. Yeah, so it might not answer the exact question that um, this person is asking, but there was a text that I read by John C. Bayers and Mike Stay um, on monoidal categories and their relation to multiple different disciplines. Um, so I believe the title was Physics, Topology, Logic, and Computation, a Rosetta Stone. Um, and I think that for me, although, although I can't remember many of the details now, it was a while ago, um, but for me, that really kind of highlighted how ubiquitous um, monodal categories are as a concept. So I, I would definitely recommend uh, checking that out. Had a name. Um, yeah, another thing that comes to mind, um, I don't know if you've mentioned this yet, but um, David and Brendan wrote a really amazing book called An Invitation to Applied Category Theory. Um, which like one of the you know famous pictures from that book involves baking a lemon meringue pie, um, uh, which is like a string diagram. So, and, and they even touch on enriched category theory. So that's really accessible. I think um, if you don't come from a math background as well, because it's sort of introducing basic ideas category theory with applications in mind as the title suggests. Um, there's another, so speaking of monoidal categories, there's another book coming out. I mentioned um, Nosen Yanofsky earlier, so I can put this in the chat as well, but there's a new book coming out called Monoidal Categories, which is described as being introductory for self-learners and non-math majors. And I think it's like everything you could ever want to know in theory about monoidal categories. I don't think it's out yet, but there's a like a free view online so folks might find that a helpful resource so I can put that in the chat. Great uh, thanks Eugenia. Uh, thanks everyone I'd just like to add that I think that I do believe that way back millions of years ago when Simon Willerton and I were making Catsley's videos Simon did a series on string diagrams and our videos are extremely low tech from before the era of any graphics or any editing and the reason I stopped making videos is that it's gone way out of my uh, realm of ability now. So we just wrote on chalkboards, but people still tell me that they find them helpful. And so that that might be helpful. And also I do feel like this is the kind of thing where Google is your friend and that there will be many resources and many resources will come up if you Google and there'll be loads of people who have helpfully written blogs, even if they, they may have been grad students at the time and are not in category theory anymore, but their blogs are still up there and maybe very helpful. And so there are quite often times when people ask me things and I just Google them immediately. And then and then I go, oh wait, but 
you could Google that. And all I'm doing is Googling it and then using, but then maybe I have, have I have developed more, I, I acknowledge that I have developed more techniques for sifting through Google math results and that that can be a helpful thing. And that, that that's also another skill that I suppose we could include in education more. But anyway, yes, I would encourage you to believe that Google is your friend for math and in particular category theory. Wonderful. Uh, so let me thank everyone again. I really appreciate all the time that went into the preparation of this panel. Firstly and foremostly for the people who submitted the questions that you know none of this would have happened without you. So we really appreciate all the thoughtful questions we received. And also thanks, of course, to our panelists, um, not only for being here with us today, but for all the great work that you've done in sharing category theory with the masses. Um, and thanks finally to the Topos Institute for hosting us and providing this resource and so many others. Oh. Thanks, everyone. This was great. <laughs> so I guess we'll end here. And um, thanks again. And um, we'll follow up uh, with questions afterwards and some of the great suggestions. So okay. bye, everyone. <laughs>